Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambu tassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambu tassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambu tassa Aparuta de sangamatasa taura a sort of one tab of moon turn to Satan. So this afternoon, the opportunity to reflect on the way things are, what we call the Dhamma, the absolute, ultimate reality. And it's an interesting time on uh, YouTube, just on how available these kind of teachings are now, kind of uh, on the internet. So it's not just kind of religious, <clears throat> trying to convert people to different religions or belief systems, or to convince they, there's no God or make a stand for atheism. But it's so many of these teachers now, Advaita teachers, Buddhist teachers, come out and give very useful reflections on what we call in this tradition, Dhamma. I see this is a good sign because ultimately, you know, when we, because I've developed the, this path through the Theravada school of Buddhism, then my, my intellectual mindset and my practice has been through using the, the teachings of the Buddha, which are all pointing to Dhamma, the way things are. So, suffering is the first noble truth. It's not Dhamma, it's not a, the Dhamma. It's a truth that will be investigated. <clears throat> and so it's a kind of <clears throat> very skillful, wise teaching of the Buddha of, the, of ancient India uh, to kind of point to this very common ex human experience. Because we all, human beings, we experience a lot of suffering. So suffering is a noble truth to be understood rather than to just believe everything is suffering. And then the Buddha pointed to the way, the cause of suffering, which is this ignorant grasping of the very conditions that arise and cease and change who we have very little control over. We have our karmic inheritance, our genetic inheritance to live with, these human forms that are subject to all kinds of ailments, getting old, getting sick, death. And yet so much of our culture reinforces this sense of a separate self, of we, we are this physical body. So most of us who were brought up in non-Buddhist or non-Asian cultures in the West, in Europe or America, we were brought up to believe that we are, uh, the physical body is what we actually are. And this is being challenged, not through saying, you're not the physical body, but, but to investigate, are you, 
really this physical form? Is this your true identity? So it's like self-inquiry, investigating, you know, through questioning. We've been, Western society tends to take for granted that we are. We have birth certificates and passports, proof that we are, you know, the, the worldly conditions that we experience are all reinforcing this sense of separateness as I'm separate from you because my physical body is different than yours. And men are separate from women because of the gender. Races are different because of the color and on and on like that. So we, we create these illusions about ourselves that we can't, it's our karma being brought up in, in a Western culture that actually believes and imposes those beliefs on us from when, from our early innocent years of childhood, teenage, and so forth. But are we a physical form? And then the Buddha, you know, encouraged us to investigate, like the three kinds of desire So the second noble truth is, is uh, reflecting on the causes. It's an investigation of the causes. You're not just grasping the words that are, you know, in Pali or translations of them, but actually applying them. What is desire? We all know desire. The body is a desire form. These human bodies are forms about getting, surviving, about eating food, about sensory impressions of pleasant, unpleasant, beautiful, ugly, that we experience through the senses. So we, we develop certain preferences, certain concepts, certain biases, prejudices, uh, positions we take on righteous views, and uh, by doing this, by clinging to these concepts, these perceptions that we've created in our conscious minds, we tend to operate from all kinds of biases and opinions, and that's why the world is the way it is. And reading the news of the day, you know, you realize how the political system in the UK and in the United States and every other country in the world is based on this idea, ideals of, of uh, human rights and democracy. But they don't, uh, you know, they don't prepare us for dealing with the karma, the, the, what we've inherited through our genetic inheritance, how we've been conditioned, whether we're from a poor family, a wealthy family, a white family, a black family, you know, these are conditioning experiences that are going to be very different for each one of us. So there's so much emphasis on, on uh, not being racist or anti-Semitic. And in that very emphasis, these are kind of noble ideals. We create the very conditions where uh, these racist views, anti-Semitism, and uh, these kind of uh, biases that are are strictly illusions we tend to be uh, influenced by. Either we're, we're anti-Semitic or we're not or we're against those who are. So we develop, you see, those who are anti-Semites are bad people. Good people are who are not anti-Semitic, 
who respect the rights of human, every human being, the equality and so forth. These are very righteous and noble concepts, but they are concepts. It's not the way life is in terms of Dhamma. It's not about righteousness and justice and fairness. It's about the way things change, the impermanent nature that we're all experiencing through these forms, through the senses that we have. So, and the Buddhist teaching is to reflect on this, to begin to notice this, how, you know, we form prejudices through grasping views that we, we maybe have no responsibility for, that we've been told is right, we've been conditioned to believe. So religious conditioning is a, still a conditioning, whether it's Buddhist conditioning or Christian conditioning. It's still taking something that somebody else tells you into your own mental uh, conditioning and operating from it. So remember that the Buddha emphasized that all conditions are impermanent. And that means, that, mean, that gives the equality about conditions, their very nature, whatever, they're, whether they're righteous or prejudiced or biased or evil or saintly, they are impermanent, they arise and cease. And this we can begin to recognize as we investigate. Even a, a righteous view, which is very liberal and fair and just, comes and goes in our minds. It's not a permanent state of mind. You know, all memories that we have, the cultural conditioning we've received is, is about remembering. Where do I belong? Am I, am I a, a really a... a an American? Is this my identity? So, and, and then I've taken British citizenship. Am I really British? Can I claim to be British? Where do I belong? In Britain or America? In Thailand? I lived so many years in Thailand. Am I, can I identify as being Thai? You know, these are questions to ask. Do you need an identity, an identity with a culture, with a tradition? Or is this just an imposition in this world of incessant, relentless changingness that now, through reflective awareness, we're witnessing to? It's the way it is. It's not about judging making, you know, because judgments are concepts based on one's personal views of right and wrong. So the three kinds of desire, gama dana, is, is, you know, this is a sensory body. It has the senses, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body itself. We have a brain. We can acquire language skills. We can discriminate between various things. And, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of gift that we have in this form, this, this mammalian form as a human being. But to reflect on it is the way out of suffering. It's not ending suffering as a, as a personal entity. It doesn't mean that enlightenment means you don't experience suffering anymore. But an enlightened individual is one who knows suffering is, is, uh, is a noble truth. 
and this realm that we see here, smell, taste, touch, think, and believe in, is forever changing. It's not going to. It's not going to progress into a utopian, uh, ideal society where everybody, everything's fair and just, and there's no biases or prejudices. Because that's not the way things actually are. But the suffering is something we create onto the present moment by judging it. So in terms of investigation, all conditions are impermanent. Is there any, can any, is there any condition that is not permanent? So if we take the Buddha's word for it in the Theravada scriptures, all conditions are impermanent. So conditions, the word, English word conditions, uh, includes everything that has a separate form or that arises and ceases, bor is born or dies, it has a beginning and ending. So that includes the whole sensual realm that we experience through this form. The bodies we have, or the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, uh, what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, the objects of senses. You know, here in Amaravati, just going for a walk this morning, noticing the, the mist in the field and the, and the barrenness of the trees and on and on like that is, we can take that for granted, but reflecting on it, it's the way it is. We call this the, the autumn or the winter. We give it a title. We have preferences like people, uh, I'm going to Thailand next week, and people say, oh, you're going to escape the English winter. Because Thailand in December and January is a very nice climate. So one can think of it as, as an escape from the English winter. But that's not where I'm going. Because I, I, I like the English winter equally as the other seasons. It's not something I create. Uh, aversion to or long for something warmer or better than I, I imagine. The English winter is like this. And it doesn't mean I like, like everything about it, but it, it's the way it is. And then I let go of my personal conditioned views about cold weather and winter time and and uh, all that, I don't create or believe or hold on to such opinions or views anymore, so there's no suffering. One just adjusts to the changing climate, the climatic conditions. Uh, so, but the uh, gamma dana, the sensual desire, you know, is we, the senses themselves are untrustworthy, impermanent. You know, as you, even when you're young, you can have all kind of difficult problems with vision or hearing. But in my old age, my vision is not very good, my hearing's not very good, and it's like this. Because that's what old bodies of old men are like. They, they, they're they packing up. They're not as good as they were when I was young. But the body is not a personal identity. It's not what I regard as my real self. It's just like the English seasonal changes. It's time now, it's winter time. 
things are falling off the trees, visions going, I find it difficult to walk, it's like this. Is that suffering or is it just the way it is for an old human body is like this? It's not personal. So there's no suffering. It, it ends in just pure awareness. So Gavadana is very interesting to reflect upon how the objects that we see change and the uh, organ of the eye that sees the objects changes and the eyes depend on light, don't they? You have to see, you have to, you, you can't see at night time. So I remember one experience, one experiment I made years ago in, uh, in my investigation of just the experience of seeing. And I, you know, I noticed how I'd sit on the porch of my kuti in Thailand and watch the sun rise in the morning in the forest, and how as it became at first everything looked dark. All the trees had green leaves on them, but they looked black to me because there was not enough light. The color green needs a lot of light for it to manifest as green. And then as the sunrise became more dominant, then began to see green leaves on the trees. Just something like that, an investigation of, of how light and color depend on each other. It, are the trees permanently green, even in the dark? We assume so, because if we take a torch to them at night, middle of the night, and shine it on the trees, they are green. But it takes, for green to manifest, it takes light. So this is like dependence of conditions on each other. And that which is aware of light and dark. And I remember going into a, into a cupboard which was totally black, total, totally dark, closing the door. And then I couldn't see anything. I couldn't, there was no light in this cupboard and, and uh, everything I looked at was black. So everything around me was black. I couldn't distinguish any separate forms. But then I had this insight in this dark room that consciousness is luminous, even in a dark room. It's consciousness that is light, brings awareness to the way it is. Even when your senses, even when there's no light to see by, there's still conscious awareness. It doesn't depend on the sun rising or electricity or anything like that. So that's an experiment just that I made years ago, just to enjoy this investigation that, that we're invited to participate in, to investigate our life, our experience of, of the forms that we have, the way we are. Then in terms of bhavadana, wanting to become something. So we're here because most of us, I assume all of us are here because we want to become enlightened. So that's a very altruistic, high-minded wish to be enlightened. So we come to monasteries or meditation centers because we feel we're unenlightened. So on the self-view, 
you know, my person, personality didn't feel enlightened at all. And I assume, you know, and I was very fascinated by Buddhist teachings long before I entered a monastery. But I read all kinds of books on Buddhism, which I found inspiring. The teachings of the Buddha inspired me. But after a while, you, you can't depend on inspiration. Like anything else, it, it's impermanent. Just to be inspired by reading Buddhist texts and commentaries and so forth is good, good karmic conditioning. But it also becomes, you know, you realize that it's, it's not making any real changes. Except maybe you have more trust, more faith in, in the Buddha's teachings. And then you decide to come to Amravati and, and try to practice what the Buddha taught. So like Amravati is a place for, to investigate. Who are you anyway? What is it that is aware in a dark room? Conscious awareness doesn't cease because there's no light to see anything. Consciousness you can't see, you can't find. You know, it's not an object that you can taste or smell or hear. It has no form. Dhamma is formless. It's unmanifested. But it's here and now. So what is it that's, that's always with us, no matter if we're sick or healthy or in a dark room or in a, uh, noon time in on a spring day in England. What is that never depends on anything else for its presence, and that's conscious awareness. It's not dependent upon other conditions to manifest. So that's, you know, when we ask the question, is there something that is permanent? You know, and this I asked myself years ago when I was a summoner, is if the Buddha said all conditions are impermanent, I just decided to make up a Zen koan. Is there something that is permanent? And then my intellect would say, well, everything is impermanent. That's what the Buddha said. So that was like accepting the, the teachings, you know, good teaching, everything is impermanent. But investigation isn't just grasping the Buddha's words and defending them in various ways, but in actually, you know, their directional signs are pointing the way to realize what you really are. So you start questioning what you think you are, believe you are, is become is very impermanent. You, you know, according to whether you're healthy, young or old, male or female, the state of mind, the, the season of the year, the, the personality, the, the emotions change according to the con other conditions. So people praise you and you feel happy, and then they criticize you and feel angry. But that which is aware of happiness at being praised and angry at being criticized, that's conscious awareness. That doesn't, we have that whatever's happening to us. That doesn't come and go according to, to conditioning. But we don't notice it because when we're happy, we want to stay that way. When we're unhappy, we want to get rid of it. 
we'd like to have a life where we're just fulfilled and happy and loved and appreciated and we live to a ripe old age in good health is ideal on a personal desire. But that's not the way life is. The bodies have to, they just get old. Senses fade. The organs of the body don't work so well. You get kinds of diseases. People get cancer or COVID or other kinds of unpleasant diseases that we don't want. We want to cure all these diseases. But this realm is a realm of birth and death. Planet Earth is a realm of birth and death. It's a death realm. Everything's going to die. And then be born again in another form. But it's all in this incessant changingness of conditioned phenomena that we suffer from because we believe. We actually believe in it. Unquestionably belief in, in the illusions we've been conditioned by, by our societies, by our families, by our religions. So it's important in this tradition to, to examine belief. Just like, because the Buddha said all conditions are impermanent, then in my first impression was, I believe that totally, so they are. Unquestionably, all conditions are permanent. It's in the scriptures. It's basic Buddhism. It's Dhamma. So that means that I have the, uh, you know, I'm grasping the teaching, which is the beginning stage. So that's fair enough. It's, it's to Bariyati Dhamma or studying the scriptures is good karma. Making good karma. Things that bring happiness or faith or trust into our lives. Inspire us. But then Happiness is very dependent. You know, how many suttas can you read and still remain inspired? Even the most inspiring days in us can become boring or just mechanical. We chant scripture, or we chant suttas and things like that, and we don't even know. Many of you don't even know what they mean. Chanting in Pali language, a language that we don't know. But investigating, is there something that is permanent? And so this is where self-inquiry begins to operate. What is, what is it that's aware of impermanence? Can, can an impermanent condition know, know the impermanence of another condition? Does, does the conditioning process, does it have any real conscious awareness? Or does it depend on the consciousness here and now that we, that we experience, whether we're young or old, male or female, healthy or unhealthy. So there's, you know, they talk about self-inquiry, and that's what these, the Four Noble Truths is really a, a self-inquiry. It's not about grasping the, the teachings, memorizing the Dhamma Jaka Pavatana Sutta, even though that's good karma. It won't be liberating until you actually investigate 
And that we're encouraged to do here in Amravati, the whole point of being here, is to take this occasion We experience life through the senses. So experience is all about sense. Yeah. You know, we experience uh, through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. We experience thinking. We experience emotional habits that we have developed in our lifetime. We experience the seasonal changes. We experience uh, growing old of our bodies. We experience uh, success and failure, praise and blame. But we don't experience consciousness because that's what we are, this pure conscious awareness is not personal, is not separative, it's not Buddhist. It is perfect and whole and complete. And that's what we began to, re we began to realize as we investigate the experiences that we have through the body and the senses not taking them personally anymore, seeing it in very personal terms, uh, you know, being rewarded for being good and being punished for being bad, but we began to just be the witness, the silent witness to the changing phenomena that we experience. And that witness is permanent. It's not a person, and we can ignore it as we get caught up in our old habits and beliefs, our biases, our prejudices, our, our aspirations. We can easily get caught up into that. But as you trust your awareness more and more, conscious awareness, You know, it is impersonal. It's where everything ceases. So I've been meditating a lot on consciousness without feature, without end, luminous all around. Here is where the earth, fire, water, and air have no footing, find no footing. So in awareness, as we abide in conscious awareness, in that's our real refuge in Dhamma, that's the real, rea that's ultimate reality. Then, earth, fire, water, and air, which is all the form, manifest forms that we experience through the body and the senses, It isn't that they all disappear, but they, they're no longer blinding us. The way we're blinded when we're attached to the forms as our identity. So being attached to a form, no matter how virtuous it might be, or how evil it might be, that attachment binds us to karmic habit patterns. You know, so when we talk about karma, as kusala karma, kusala karma, piyakata karma, and, and this is, this is, a, karma is a, is a useful word, oftentimes misused, because we say, my karma. We identify a lot with our karma, or it's an excuse. We excuse our behavior because we say, it's my karma to be like this. And I've heard many people, including Westerners, claim this. It's, it's, 
that my karma, uh, kind of fatalistic, I'm a victim of my karma, I can't help myself, is based on this, this uh, sense of I am this form, this person, this separate person that has a separate karma from you. And that whole illusion is is what we we you know we we tend to uh, grasp, and it's learning to break through this illusion. Are you really what you believe and think? Is your karma really yours? Is it really a a person? Is it really what you want to be? So rather than making problems about the way we are or our karma, we begin to understand and use it for observing. You're the, the witness, the puto, the witness of karma, not the karma anymore. You're taking your stand with the conscious awareness, which is not karma. And as you trust that, taking a stand with conscious awareness, you begin to abide in it. It's your real refuge. No matter what happens to you in life, whether it's being praised or blamed or being healthy or sickly, you don't create suffering around the karma of these forms, your, the karma of your own form or anyone else's. So the third noble truth is Niroda, or the end of suffering. So one assumes that, that once you have that enlightened insight, that you don't suffer anymore, that it ends forever. But that's another belief. The end of suffering is always here and now. It's not about practicing now to end suffering in the future. The end of suffering, Naroda, is here and now. Conscious awareness is here and now. So no matter what your karmic past might be, or all your good intentions to change it in the future, the liberation is always available this very moment. And learning to trust that liberation it, you know, you, you, you realize that your true nature is Dhamma, universal conscious awareness, apparent here and now and timeless. So that's the end of suffering. And just in my own practice of this path, just seeing how, because I get a lot of praise, um, I have been criticized by many, uh, I've, you know, been given high titles, I'm, I have to be very careful about walking, uh, old age is like this, but it's not, it's not, it's the, the natural state of a, of a form that's not self, it's not mine anymore. It's, it's the way things are, all conditions are impermanent. And conscious awareness is not a condition. It's not about something that, that drops. And so when, I haven't died yet, but what is death when the, there's no more, when the body no longer, the senses no, no longer operate? 
the brain doesn't work, the heart stops, the breathing stops. <coughs> does consciousness really stop? Or does the body just, it's time for it to die? But is the consciousness a dead person is not conscious anymore, but the consciousness that that person had when they were alive is the same as our consciousness here and now. It doesn't die. So it's the deathless amatta dhamma that we begin to realize for ourselves. So I offer this as a reflection.